personal feelings don't intrude. You have not been hired to uh, perform those personal things. You are working on behalf of the people, on behalf of the state, and that is what should happen. Thank you. Chairman, may I refer the nominee to Article 122 of the 1992 Constitution and probably just to learn from her criminal content, criminal content, and Parliament wanting to exercise uh, 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 under uh, contempt of Parliament, uh, educate us on it. When Parliament says that it wants to charge somebody for contempt, related to contempt within the practice within the judicial system of Ghana, and then just make a comment on Article 122, contempt of Parliament. What can Parliament do and not do relative to contempt? Thank, thank you very much. The institutions of state have to be protected against conduct that undermines their standing because they exist for the general good. It is a subversion of the general good when the institutions are attacked such that their, their, their purpose and worth and so on are undermined. The same goes for parliament as for um, the courts because for many people, the courts remain the last hope and it is not good if people undermine the efficacy of the judicial system and so on. Then what are you leaving them with but self-help, which nobody wants? I know that Parliament has this opportunity, but Article 1253 also talks about the judicial power vesting in the judiciary. And so... Any exercise of power that amounts to judicial power may be crossing the separation of powers line. Chairman, thank you very much. I note again that the nominee has some writings. Ghana Police Service. As you may prof, you were just driving from Legon towards where you used to head last year, the Center for International Affairs, and out on the street, heading towards Medina, you saw an MTTU policeman slap a trotter driver and want to pull him out of the car. What would be your fair sense with your respect for criminal law in Ghana, your intuitive sense? Mr. Chairman, people don't lose their rights because they have offended. Indeed, the fair trial provisions in the Constitution arise only when you have broken the law. So, is slapping a trotter driver part of the work of a police officer? A police officer who is enforcing law and is doing so by means that the law does not support. They know the ways in which they can do their work. They know the powers of arrest they have none of those would permit that kind of slapping. So the law gives you an a chance with all kinds of powers to be able to do your work. But when you exceed those powers, then you must be taken to task. I certainly, I would not confront an angry policeman and get a slap and apology later, but I would definitely contact, I would definitely contact somebody in the police hierarchy and make a complaint. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Article 127, uh, within the context of the principle of separation of powers, we have the three co-equal arms of government. Do you conceive of the judicial, judiciary of Ghana as financially independent and autonomous within the meaning of Article 1271 of the Constitution? You may refer to it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's always a thorny issue when the resources of the uh, country are controlled by the executive and the legislature has the power of the purse 
and the judiciary needs money to function. But I think there's a reasonable control to enable the judiciary to, by and large, stay independent. No money can be spent without parliament's approval. So that in itself operates as a check on the executive. Because let's face it, somebody has to take charge of the resources and allocate. So it's always a problem of um, the executive taking the estimates and working with them and so on. And yet it's the one who shares what's in the pot, who really has to know what is needed. In Liberia, for example, the judiciary makes a direct application to parliament. Even though parliament controls the power of the purse, let's say that the purse is in the pocket of the executive and parliament controls the, the, the power to open it. So whatever happens, somebody would control um, the expenditure. But even the principle of separation of powers does not talk of such total and unrelated separation. They say they are separate but equal, separate but interdependent. So it's unavoidable that the one who controls the purse string, strings can exercise some control. But fortunately, the executive doesn't do both. So the three arms have to cooperate so that the protection that the Constitution offers the judiciary through the legislature would be actualized. Yes, Honorable Minister for Housing. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm also glad in that uh, one of my lecturers is being elevated, maybe probably in the evening of her years to sit in the Supreme Court. She always wore a smile when she was lecturing. And I'm grateful to her for uh, contributing to my um, education. And now I sit as a lawyer. Thank you, Madam. I'll just ask one question from your CV and I'll ask a couple of questions and then I'll be done. Um, you said, uh, you have three children. Uh, may I know whether you were blessed with a child who had your intellectual bent? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'm more than blessed. My, my three daughters, two of whom are here, uh, the third one could not be here because she has an online meeting with her university. She's reading for her PhD at Oxford. Oh. And she had a meeting with the university today, so she could not be here. Yes. But the three of them are doing very well. Two are lawyers, mm. start making, beginning to make waves themselves. The eldest is the managing director of the family company. She is the one r r responsible for the National Science and Maths Quiz. And I believe all of you know the, the waves she's been making on in, in education. So I will say that I, 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 the grace of God has abounded. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, my substantive questions. There is a rule of evidence that he who alleges must prove, and the burden of proof can change. In the presidential election petition, it was the Electoral Commissioner, Dr. Farijan, who declared President Mahama, based on the constitutional arithmetic, that he had 50 plus one of the votes cast. And there go the president-elect of the Republic of Ghana. Some juries believe that the burden of proof should have been on Dr. Farijan, the declarant of the results who should have proved to the Supreme Court how he arrived at 50 plus one. And this would have curtailed eight months of laborious trial. What is your view on the burden of proof, the presidential election petition? Well, why you would um, take that position some things are easier to prove than others. And a person who is alleging 
that his rights have been infringed is the one who has to show how the right has been infringed. And then the uh, processes can continue. If you reverse the burden, then anybody, I'm not just thinking of uh, the presidential petition, but anybody can make an allegation and then call upon you to prove. That is why even in the law of thoughts, the, the evidential rule about um, the, the, the case speaking for itself, res ipsa loquita, is an exception to the rule. So maybe with more experience, we should be able to determine that uh, in such a situation, it's a res ipsa situation. But if you had no basis for complaining about the computation, you wouldn't have gone to court. So surely there's nothing wrong with you being called upon to prove how you came by that position so that the person against whom you are alleging uh, improper conduct or indolence or dishonesty would then have a chance to answer. So I can understand why you would say that, but I think all things considered, we are better off leaving things as they are. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yesterday, I asked a very interesting question on the review jurisdiction of the um, um, Supreme Court. And I think uh, being a lecturer and with a very elastic mind, I might want to ask this question again because I have a view different from the answer I got. Relating to the review jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, it is the position of some jurors that the seven judges who will sit on the case should not include the original five justices who dealt with the case at the first instance. The reason is that the five justices who originally sat on the case always take the position that we have made up our minds. Don't disturb us with the facts. Do you share this view that the seven new justices should review the case? And if not, why not? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's not a, a pseudo appellate jurisdiction. And for that reason, it must be protected. It is a good mechanism to get them to take another look. And the practice has been to add people who were not originally part of the panel. You, you cannot assume that those who first had the case were in the wrong, and that a, a completely different panel would judge differently. We have to have some assurance that when the Supreme Court has given a decision, it is final. So yes, there's the power of review. Yes, you, have, uh, you can ask for a review, but it can, the, the process cannot go on endlessly. My final question, Mr. Chairman. Prof, do you consider the Constitution as a political document, which will mean that where you are going to sit and remain for, there for about some seven years, you'll be handing down decisions of serious political ramifications. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. To the extent that the, the constitutional provisions have been negotiated, they represent a political negotiation of what the rules going forward should be. In life, everything is political. Even what you hand your children to eat. It is partisan politics that we usually take issue with. But the essence of having a constitution is that it better guarantees the right of the individual as the different organs of government stay within the space that they've been allocated, and so the individual is the better off for it. 
It sets out how we may do things, how we may not do things, what our entitlements are. It guarantees our rights. It doesn't even grant them because rights, we say, precede, um, are, are inherent in um, being human. So it is a political document. You can't get away from that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity. Let me join colleagues in congratulating Professor Henrietta and Sabonsu. Congratulations, Madam. Um, first of all, I want to find out from you if you, I'm sure you, 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 you have publications before the nomination of Madame Jen Mensa to become the Electoral Commissioner suggested that you were considered for that post. Uh, have you ever been approached for the post of Electoral Commissioner by uh, anyone close to the appointing authority or the appointing authority themselves? Mr. Chairman, this was a very difficult time for me. Nobody had approached me for anything. <laughs> and yet I kept seeing headlines. Somebody even had a headline explaining why I turned it down. <laughs> and it, it was a very difficult time for me. People were saying, hold a press conference. And, and I said, what are you going to deny? Nobody has offered you anything. What are you going to deny? So let's just say that I won the popular vote. Thank you. <laughs> Would you have accepted it, though, if you were uh, contacted? Um, I may disagree with the honorable member, because that is a position at the level of Court of Appeal. And I believe that with my track record, I ought to move and aspire higher. Thank you. Now, um, I, will want, I want to find out what your position is on sexuality, sexual abuse, and the desire by some people for sex education to be promoted, especially at the basic level. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm sure you can see that I have a publication on, uh, uh, yes, sex, the sex, sexual offenses and the which I describe as sexual self-expression, because self, sexual self-expression is one of the things that we, we, that are normal to the human being and yet expressed a certain way becomes criminal. So I look at all of those things. It's a part of life, but unfortunately we are changing. And so we must do things differently. In our day, our parents did not give us much sex education. But in this day, with all the um, technology, all the media information and so on, you endanger a child's life if you do not direct the child as to the correct things to do. I know that it is the work of parents but 